any um, any questions anything that um, based on what we saw any doubts clarifications in chapter 4 right um okay um okay let's look at chapter 5 chapter 5 definitely you will have some questions for sure um so chapter 5 he again three we can look at it as three sections one is um um uh, he suggests some action against uh, what is seen as a sin blatant sin in the church then he talks about um, the passover lamb the unleavened bread and also he talks about relating to those who are in willful sin okay, having a lifestyle of sin okay so um okay so let's look at uh, chapter 5 okay so it starts by saying it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you for i indeed as absent in body but present in spirit have already judged as though i were present him who has done so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are to gather together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, in the day of our Lord Jesus. So he's saying, okay, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality. And that kind of sexual immorality that is not even there among the Gentiles, right? Um, and he, he kind of describes that, that is talking about incest, right? Sexual immorality, all kinds of deviant uh, sexuality, okay, which is outside of marriage, before marriage, and all kinds of things, right? Now, the thing is this, you know, we, we are talking about Corinth, okay? A place, like we said, you know, where worship itself is perverted, right? So we must understand that. So which means that it's, you know, this kind of immorality and typically sexual immorality is very rampant in all levels of society. Okay. So here he's saying, you know, hey, in the church, there is, it is reported. Okay. So which means that it is pretty obvious, right? Um, which means it's continuing. Okay. Otherwise, how will the gathering of people know? You know, of this kind of a sin, right? Uh, which means it's obvious, it's continuing, it's a, it's become a lifestyle, right? So it is reported. So who reported to Paul? Again, yeah, Chloe's household, Chloe and the household. So they they could not, you know, they could not, they didn't know know how to address it. They did probably they said, okay, we've tried, it's not worked. So we need to, you know, we need to take it. It needs to be done. Something needs to be done. So, he's, you know, he has come to know about this, right? And he's, uh, and this is what he says. This, this is the kind of, you know, this is the kind of immorality that is there. This is the kind of, uh, you know, relationship of a sexual nature which is there. That is incest, right? Um, or, and he's saying that um, you are, you are all proud. You have not mourned, verse 2, that he has, who has done this might be uh, taken away, right? So, uh, in the sense, he's saying that you are proud to the point of being tolerant of this kind of thing that is happening. Uh, in other words, it could be that you are indifferent, right? You're saying, okay, I don't know, whatever they they live their life, that's not my problem. You know, you're indifferent. And he's saying you should have actually mourned, grieved deeply that this kind of thing is happening, right? And that is among believers. So that is, uh, you know, many times we, you know, we we actually condemn, or we are indifferent, or we say, okay, I don't know, let them sort it out. But we, you know, we don't see this kind of a reaction where there is a mourning, that there is a sadness. That this kind of a thing, sin is happening, okay, and uh, and he says that 
the man in his conduct you know will be removed from the local church community right but they you did not do that you just tolerated this you continuing right um in fact paul when he uh, sorry not paul when you look at the book of revelation also you know uh, in um, what the lord says i have this among i have this against you right so he says that um, in verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 20 right to the church in thyatira right? uh, chapter 2 chapter 2 verse 20 nevertheless i have a few things against you because you allow that woman jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols right so this is to the church and he's saying hey you're allowing this i have this against you you're allowing this which means somehow you're being passive right you're just saying that okay maybe you're saying it's not my problem maybe you're saying okay uh you're just turning a blind eye to it and right? whatever it is you are you know you're allowing this to continue so similar situation here in corinth as well right so then verse 3 he says something very verse 3 to 5 he says something very very harsh it seems like this right he says uh, i have already judged in the name of our lord jesus christ i have judged with the power of the lord you know the empowerment that he's given me and uh, the spiritual authority that he's given me um and so i have with the authority that is given me even though physically i was not present i have actually judged i have acted on behalf of the as the head of the church i have acted on behalf of the church um and he says that what did he do he says deliver such a one to satan okay for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of lord jesus christ okay so very it seems like a very harsh instructions harsh command right so he goes on to explain okay what is this delivering someone to satan okay so is he saying that okay now you know satan you come and destroy okay so that is the thing uh, obvious thing you know that we see that okay he was saying that here's another believer he's living in sin and you are actually saying satan you come and you take you know destroy this person's life because he is the thief who comes to steal kill and destroy okay so what does that mean you know does that mean that we can, we can go around doing this that we say we see someone and we say okay now you know destruction we speak a curse we you know what is it right so the rest of the the rest of the passage talks about that okay so it's um, when we say talking about delivering a person to satan okay this is what is talking about is talking about a person who of course the seriousness of it first of all is talking about a person who's living in sin okay and the sin is very obvious everybody knows about it and what is the sin it's a sexual sin and it's a sin where you know a person is living with uh, you know uh, probably it's like a stepmother or whatever is having a physical relationship right and it's come to know everybody has come to know probably this is my opinion probably people tried correcting okay people tried talking people tried correcting but the person refused correction right so this is the seriousness of it and so in that situation with the unwillingness to repent okay so he what is he saying he's saying that i'm delivering that person to satan right for the destruction of the body so at least you know the, okay his spirit or soul will be saved right um now if you if you look at um uh, sorry uh, if you look at the verse is following that okay um okay we'll come to that we'll come to that a little later it is in um um Okay, plus five. Okay, so this is what um, he, 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 you know, is is talking about. He is saying, um, purge out verse seven, no, on Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, 
right? Since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So, and verse six, do, don't you know? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So he's saying, okay, this is what is going to happen. There's going to be influence, and it's going to corrupt everyone. You're going to be first of all, okay. You are being passive. You are tolerating this sin in other person's life. Then you will begin to tolerate that sin in your own life, because that's the standard that you're going to have. Right? The standard with which you you see another person and tolerate, you're going to have the same standard for your own life. Right? So he's saying, okay, this is what is going to happen. A little leaven will leaven uh, the whole lump. Therefore, purge out the whole leaven. Okay, and then he is also saying that um, uh, if you look at the the verses following and. Uh, Verse 12 onwards, he says, verse 12, judging those who are outside, do not judge. Uh, and uh, he's saying, do not keep company. He's, in other words, what he's saying is that I'm asking you to excommunicate this person. This can, person cannot continue to fellowship um, in this particular place. Right? This person is calling himself a believer. This person is not. Uh, adhering to any of the, you know, values of the word, this person is also, uh, in my opinion, not listening to correction, not listening to any kind of uh, changes that instruction. He's continuing to live this kind of a life, right? So, this delivering to Satan is actually putting this person out of a fellowship, out of church out of fellowship out of the protective covering that a person has when he or she is among a gathering of believers so now that's another thing that we uh, that we understand okay so let's look at uh, some of these things um you know what does this deliver to satan mean okay willful sin and willful sin itself opens the life of someone to for satan to destroy them right it, it opens the doorway right Continued willful sin opens the doorway for a person for uh, opens the doorway for a person for Satan to attack. Okay, that's one thing. Right? Already now, when we look at the context of the passage, we see that he's saying you excommunicate or you you need to put that person out of fellowship so that the others uh, don't get affected. And this act of putting the person out of fellowship of the local church is saying they no longer come under the spiritual protection. So this is the context. This is the specifics of that particular sin that their person is living with, right? Uh, having as a lifestyle. And therefore, this extreme decision, right? So that is the thing. So they are not under the spiritual protection, first of all, personally. They open the doorway, and also corporately. You know, you understand that, right? Two two aspects. Personally, they are open the doorway. Corporately, as a body, you know, where we have people praying over for, you know, corporately also, they are not under the spiritual protection. So that is what it means. It doesn't mean that you, you know, you're saying, okay, Satan, come destroy, which is already happening, right? Uh, so that's the thing, right? So. Uh, and okay, he says, okay, for the destruction of the flesh, right? So what is that? So this word flesh is generally used for people. Okay, we see in Acts chapter two, I think, when we say uh, this word flesh is used for people, we mean human beings. It also refers to the physical body, and it also refers to what is earthly, what is um, uh, what is carnal, right? Which means a sinful appetite. It refers to that. Romans chapter eight talks about that, like somebody who is carnal, right? A carnal person. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Who is a carnal person? A person who is whose mind is constantly on the things of the flesh, right? So it means it talks about 
spiritual appetites or sorry fleshly appetites bodily appetites which are contrary to the word of god so this word is used in all these ways in all these contexts right so so the thing is this destruction of the flesh what is he saying he's saying okay this person needs to be put out of the protection of the local church or the local um, gathering because of their unrepentant a carnal sinful lifestyle and therefore in the natural right in their natural earthly human life that you know they are already vulnerable they are already open to the attack of the enemy so in their natural um, they will they will receive you know what they are actually open up to and um, so you are you are removing the spiritual protection and of that person okay so why do we do that why does he do that he says ultimately at least there is some kind of redemption so that is what he says right he says that at least his um, you know is uh, his spirit may be saved so in the sense that since he is a believer and he is is doing this and if he is destroyed in the natural at least you know he he may be saved so it may be saved there is a possibility that he is not rejected christ that his spirit may be saved so at the heart of it it is redemptive in nature right so it is not condemning and judgmental so that's something that we see that at the heart of it is redemptive in nature okay so which means that uh, when we think of discipline Uh, when we think of you know dealing with people in this ex- extreme case also right uh, it has to have the father's heart it has to have to be redemptive in nature right paul does this on a couple of other occasions also you know this is not the only time when he does this right for example if we if we look at first timothy 1 okay let's let's look at that verse okay first timothy chapter 1 and uh, verse 19 okay verse 19 and 20 um he says having faith and a good conscience which some having rejected concerning the faith have sh- suffered shipwreck okay of whom are hymenaeus and alexander whom i delivered to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme blaspheme sorry right so again a similar kind of a situation what is it they are not living their conscience is he's saying you know they they don't have a good conscience they're not living according to faith and they have rejected both faith and a good conscience they have rejected you see that right verse 19 okay and he's saying you know whom i have delivered to satan he's, he he talks about these two individuals right hymenaeus alexander saying i have delivered to satan and uh, so that the intention is that they may learn not to blaspheme okay again the same thing that they would experience something hardships whatever that they would you know learn the truth that they should not talk about the lord in this manner and you know uh, we see this uh, particular thing happening right um and again we see in second timothy also right second timothy chapter 2 verse 16 Okay, Second Timothy two two sorry uh, verse sixteen, he says, "Shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer." Hymenaeus and another person, his name is mentioned, Philetus, are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. So he's saying, you know, this is the this is what they are. They constantly go about. overthrowing the faith and they you know they are what they are teaching is heretical and so on um so we don't have apart from this hymenaeus alexander and in this case um yeah, Hymen, only these two we have directly um uh, reference where he does this extreme thing and the extreme thing is putting them out of um that fellowship of the church and because they have already opened up their heart 
they opened up their lives to the work of the enemy okay so we see that um, the local church again what is the local church is a gathering of believers what is the local church is the place of dwelling of the holy spirit right he says you are the temple of the holy spirit so so it is a place of we may not have thought like that but it is actually a place of spiritual refuge it is a place of spiritual protection right and so the kind of the kind of community that we have the kind of uh, maybe people are praying for each other we don't even know that right and there is a there is a mantle there is a protection uh, in the local church as well that is what we see right um so uh, so that is something that we understand from this the that it is a it is a gift it is a privilege for us uh, to be part of a local church gathering where you know we are coming together christ is elevated uh, christ is honored the lord is worshiped and there is you know um, we are enabling or helping one another just like we see in 1 corinthians 12 um that we are serving one another efficient like what we see in efficient 4 and so on right so so this is uh, something that is there but paul talks about this extreme decision of his okay which is also part of the um, you know the life of the local church of that day like in corinth so he he does this right okay so any any questions any thoughts um okay so uh, yanina uh, i guess these are comments yeah putting him out of christian fellowship so that he realizes what he's done and spirit saved even if he faced difficulties uh, yeah uh, i suppose these are not questions but um, your comments okay any um, any thoughts any questions no none at all okay fine okay let's look at uh, um, verses 6 to 8 okay so he's saying okay um, uh, verses 6 to 8 let's read through your glorifying is not good do you not know that a li- little leaven uh, leavens the little leaven leavens the whole lump therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened for indeed Christ our passover was crucified as our sacrifice for us therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven but with the leaven of not with the mal- leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth okay so so he he says okay you need to uh, he rebukes them you know you're glorifying your uh, elevating of oneself is not good um it's 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 bad why because this little leaven you know when he's he's talking about this yeast that is used in bread right in the flour when you mix it in it's a small it's a small it's a pinch of it but it actually works on that entire batch of dough right it works on the entire thing so just like how a little yeast is enough to make that entire dough batch of dough rise up when you're baking etc so a little bit of this kind of attitude or a sin or sinful lifestyle uh, or sexual impurity when it's there as a lifestyle in the body now it's going to affect the entire body right it's going to affect, in other words he's saying it's going to affect everybody else you know people who are you you look at it people who are not mature people who are not strong people who are um you know who are maybe living an openly sinful life they're going to look at this and and say that okay it is okay they're going to come to that conclusion it is fine right and they're going to have that as their own standard for their own lives okay so this hard instruction purge out the old leaven okay uh you need to empty out now what is he he's talking about this whole uh he's talking about the uh, passover and the old testament feast that we see in exodus 
right? We won't go into the details of that. So in the feast of the Passover, what happened? It was, um, you know, it was the leavened bread was not eaten, which means unleavened bread was eaten. A bread which was not mixed with yeast. So, um, you know, pick, uh, figuratively, that yeast represented sin, right? So, unleavened bread was eaten during the feast of the Passover, on the on the feast of the Passover. And for the seven days uh, before the Passover, you know, the whole, um, all leaven was cleared out, or all traces of yeast, wherever it was in the house, or if, if, if they had any leavened bread, bread which was baked with yeast in it, it was cleared out of the household. Okay, signifying something, it was separated, uh, it's signifying the consecration, it signified that, you know, this old life or this sinful life uh, was actually something that that is that we are separating ourselves from. Okay, it was a figurative thing. That is what they did, okay, um, and and so Paul is actually talking about that. He's saying, you know, you know this, you know, this is what we used to do, right? This is the, this was the practice that um, you clear out everything, and why? Because you knew that it was it signified sin, it signified your old way of life, it signified your sinful lifestyle. So you consecrated yourself, you cleared out your entire household from any effect, from any influence of that leaven or yeast. Right? So this is what you did. Therefore, you need to purge out the same way you need to purge out the whole leaven. So it has something to do with us personally, individually, right? individual application. And also he's talking about a corporate thing, that particular uh, incident of sin, right? Okay. okay, verse 9. Then he goes on to say, you know, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Okay, so uh, let's just read through all those verses. I wrote, in you in my, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what, I, what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Okay. So he's, 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 he's actually defining, clarifying, okay, bringing into focus this action of putting out this person who is this lifestyle. So he's saying, okay, first of all, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle. So what epistle is he talking about? So which means we understand that there was a letter that he wrote to the Corinthian church before this first Corinthians. Right? There was something that he wrote to them. Now we don't have a record of it. Um, so yeah, we don't we don't know what, what was addressed in it, but especially this particular thing was addressed, right? Paul had actually written to them. So there was an epistle before that. And so yeah, so we don't have any record, we don't have any information, and so we don't we don't concern, you know, it's not our concern. We don't um, need to go into details of that. But this is what he has addressed. This is what he has written to them. What, what is he saying? I wrote you not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Okay, And then he clarifies, okay, this sexually immoral person that I, or people whom I told you not to keep in company with is not the people of the world. Okay, so... What is he saying? He's saying it's not, I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm not talking about people who do not know Christ, people who do not know Jesus and who are there in the world. You know, If we can't keep company with such people, then we have to leave the world. Right? The world is full of such people. So he's saying, you know, I didn't, I didn't tell you not to keep company with such people in the world, 
but he's saying i told you not to keep company with people with someone who calls himself a brother or you know a sister someone who says yeah i follow jesus right someone who is a believer but they are having this kind of a lifestyle and he's talking he's list down a few things extortion idol i i think uh, you know he's saying still idolatry sexually immoral drunkard one who's extortion you know is extorting ex who is an extortioner one who is actually by forcefully taking money from people right there's extortion that happens sometimes we see on the roads people go and uh, you know and ask the shops need to give some money protection money right see some people doing it from the even from the you know from from people who are supposed to protect right so so he's saying hey this so he's saying you know i'm talking about believers i'm talking about in the church such things are happening then i'm saying you need to distance yourself don't keep company right and in other place also paul says about how evil company corrupts good habits so he's talking about believers and it's a sad thing if a believer one who says i follow the lord jesus is going to be having this as a lifestyle okay when you say an extortioner it means that they have a practice of extortion they continuing to do that when you say a drunkard it's not like the person you know by mistake or uh, once he slipped and uh, no he's having a lifestyle of drinking right uh reviler and idolater same thing you know one who's covetous and immoral so they're having a lifestyle like they're refusing to give that up they're having a lifestyle saying you cannot have fellowship you cannot have company right sometimes we you know we 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 look at somebody maybe they they fell right they struggle they fell they're not even you know these talking about people who are it is not talking about people who are struggling and trying to live a righteous life it's talking about people who have saying okay this is how i want to live i might be a believer but this is how i want to live right who are not even putting up a fight right so sometimes we see people who are struggling and we we condemn them right maybe they are they are trying you know they they have not overcome certain sin and they are struggling and we condemn them and say okay i'm not it would have nothing to do with me right so that is wrong right he's talking about someone who having a lifestyle we need to make that distinction so that is what he's clarifying to the church he's saying okay you know uh, i'm not talking about those people who are outside but i'm talking about those people who are inside so how can i judge those who are outside who do not know christ do you not judge your those who are inside okay earlier on what did he say do not judge before its time and he's talking about judging other servants of god you know people of god and he's saying okay you don't know the intents of their heart god will judge them god knows the motives of their heart and so on and here he's saying you know do you not judge those who are inside so is in other words he's saying you need to judge you need to judge so what does it mean to judge it means that you look at the pros and cons like look at their actions look at what they are doing what they are not doing and you need to judge you need to come to that's what a judge does right a judge hears what did that person do what did that person did not do what wrong did he do what right did he do and brings a verdict right he says okay this is my verdict the same way you know you're supposed to discern we are supposed to consider the pros and cons and we are supposed to judge right so he's saying do you not judge those who are inside those who are outside god will anyway judge and so he's saying when you judge when you see that okay this person when you judge rightly when you say that okay this person despite all instructions all appeals for correction is continuing to have a, such a lifestyle then you cannot keep company and that's therefore he says purge out the old leaven right put away put away from yourselves the evil person okay right so then the question what about the grace of god say grace of god is limitless 
the race of god is um, you know it's over uh, where sin abounds grace abounds even more right paul writes that in romans okay so uh let's look at second thessalonians 3 okay second thessalonians 3 verse um, 14 and 15 i got again just want to reiterate okay we're talking about someone who's living a this kind of a lifestyle when we say lifestyle it's part of their life it's a it's a regular thing okay then we look at second thessalonians 3 verses 14 and 15 Paul gives a similar instruction. He says, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Verse 15, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay, so what is he saying? You know, the intention of whole of this not keeping company is to help that person see the consequence of what they're doing okay that they are living a lifestyle which is not god honoring which is actually destroying their own lives and you need to admonish that person as a brother in doing so you're actually admonishing the person also uh, as a brother okay so so we 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 when we consider all this and um, he's very firm it seems very clinical very surgical right it's like okay i need to do this there's no question of uh, grace there's no question of uh, mercy right so we need to understand that uh, when when it when it comes to grace the lord extends grace but it comes with truth right john chapter 1 verse 17 the law was given through moses but grace and truth came through Jesus, Jesus Christ. Okay, if you look at a couple of uh, Old Testament uh, scriptures, Psalm 89 verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. So there, it is not, when, when, when we talk about grace, when the Lord extends grace, it is not devoid of truth. He does not overlook truth. It is with truth. You know, like for example, yes, there is mercy, there is forgiveness to a person who repents. But because of something that he or she has done, there might be consequences that he might have to face right? in the natural. There might be consequences. Yes, is he, is he forgiven in the Lord's eyes? Yes. Is mercy extended? Yes. But in the natural, there could be some consequences for his or her act. You know? And and that is that is the truth part of it. But grace and mercy, yes, definitely. So we need to understand that, right? So when we say, I need to extend grace to the person, right? Um, that person is messing up, that person is you know, con constantly not living up to God's standard, we need to extend grace, yes. But should we be tolerant of the kind of sin that they are they are involved in, they are entangled in? No. You know, we need to we need to address and say, okay, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Of course, you know, I, I'm extending grace, I'm extending mercy, but what you're doing is wrong. And if you're going to continue to do this, there will be consequences right there will be consequences and you cannot continue to do it so we cannot ignore it we cannot say you know i'm it's it's fine we cannot do that because we need to call it out for what it is that it is sin that it is wrong so that is the truth of it right but yes there is grace there is mercy and uh, uh, mercy always triumphs. You know, James two thirteen. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So, so when there is a, you know, when particularly to this, when there in contemporary times, okay, let's say a person is living in sin, and particularly in sexual sin or like an adultery or whatever. Um, well, the church is supposed to love that individual because God loves the sinner. Right. So it's a difficult thing, right? Because some of these 
some of the things, some of the acts that people have done or indulged in are downright terrible. Right? So it's a difficult thing. So we love the sinner, but we need to call or we need to point out and say, okay, this is wrong. This is sin. It is not God pleasing. So we can we can definitely extend grace and we can definitely be, be patient and we can say, okay, you know, you you're working with it, you're you you're struggling with this area, you want to work at it. Being we can be patient and we can enable, we can help God to uh, you know, uh, we can we help them to get help, receive uh, strength from God. But if they are unwilling to submit to God, if they are unwilling to work at it, if they are unwilling to even acknowledge that what they are doing is wrong, if they are trying to justify it and saying, okay, now I am going to live like this only, right? then that has some consequences. Right? And, uh, and you know, we have had to uh, kind of do that sometimes when when you know people lived like that. You know, there was some per person who was financial misappropriation, right? It was happening over and over again. Financial misappropriation meaning you know um, someone's finances, you know, is just borrowing and uh, also taking money, not just borrowing, you know, taking money, uh, uh, misusing spiritual authority, and saying, okay, you need to give. You know, I'm a prophet. You need to give. Uh, and you know, prophesying for money and all that, and and with young people, right? People who did not know, uh, and doing it over and over again, despite repeated warnings, despite you know saying you cannot do that. This is the last warning. Um, the person would continue to do that, and then we had to say, you know, you cannot, you know, because it's affecting the body, right? Like how it says, a little leaven. Um, leavens the entire lump right so it was affecting the body it was creating uh, damage to the body so it had to be done and similarly when it comes to marriage also a similar situation right um, blatantly you know refusing to acknowledge um, despite being a married person and refusing to acknowledge certain standards of marriage and purity and holiness we had to say right and and thankfully, you know, that person changed and came back, but the other one, it did not happen. Right. So, so these are this is sad. This is part of the you know the local life of the local church, and it happened. So um, this is this is something that we need to be aware of. Okay, so okay. Any questions here? Right. Any questions? So I, um, you know, how does one arrive at this conclusion, at this decision? Is there a pathway? Is there something that the Lord has put for us? See, it's a difficult decision, right? So how does one arrive at this decision? How does one? So suppose you're the leader in a church. You're leading a church, and uh, you need to, you know, make this decision. How would you? Do this. You're facing this problem. How would you do it? How would you arrive at it? Would you just wake up one morning and say, "Okay, I think this is it," or is there a process? What do you think? Anyone? I think we need to talk to them. Mm. Try to tell the truth and with give them time mm. to come back and uh, I mean it take it, it may take time mm. but we have to be patient okay. mm. so how long <laughs> no, sometime it will be very uh, we can make out from there uh, uh, whether they are ready to repent or uh, uh, making just wasting time or really they want to come back or really you know we can make out from their uh, attitudes and the way they respond to some extent not fully so maybe in that okay okay anyone else 
yeah that's what shaya is also asking how long can you give time for a person to repent right okay so that's the thing <laughs> so these are tough things we, there's no easy answer you can't say okay one month <laughs> you know we can't so the thing is the biblical pattern that we have for you know approaching confronting um yeah yeah chaya like is it dependent on us how long so the biblical pattern that we have is the bible says if if someone has something against us or you know if if you see someone doing wrong okay what does the word of god say you approach them personally and bring that wrong to their to the you know point it out and say okay what you're doing is wrong then if that person does not change then you go with two or three witnesses we see that path pattern right you go with two or three witnesses so which means that okay you gone you told them hey, what you're doing is wrong uh, you need to change please change and if, do you need any help you know get some help do it a uh, person probably that person says you know okay i'll do it okay then you give them some time to change right and then uh if that still continues and you come to know you are going with two or other two or three witnesses right and ag again you're addressing the same thing you're saying okay you know brother you know sister you know this is what is happening and um, it's it's a serious thing you know we're talking about very serious things serious matters right um like uh, sexual immorality or you know financial misappropriation or things like that right um or even abuse or domestic violence and and, and so you are two or three witnesses you are again addressing then you are giving them some time and even then after that if they don't change then the word of god talks about taking that extreme measure of saying that okay now it's affecting a whole lot of people this kind of lifestyle this kind of decision or this thing that you're doing therefore you know we need to make sure that that you cannot continue damaging other people's lives therefore you need to be put out and even there the bible says you admonish the person as a brother you do it with the intent that you know maybe some day they will repent and come back so that is the heart right but you're taking that decision that strong decision saying that we've done this we've done the second thing and now this is the third level of you know discipline or correction that we have to do it okay um yeah personal level consequences um yeah pray for them as we speak to them and also yeah so coming back to chaya's you know uh, thing of question of how long you know how long can we wait so this is what it is you know there's no time frame that we can give but we can say that we can all we can only say okay uh we'll give them some time to change and we don't see that change and we need to act now because we cannot continue right because their life or their decision or whatever they're doing is affecting others so um, we need to do this so so this is the pattern biblical pattern and we need to follow this right um yeah okay so we'll stop here and um, yeah we'll continue again next class from so we'll continue with chapter 6 right okay okay thank you god bless